Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I was listening to my good buddy, Peter Schiff, the other day, and he brought up a fantastic point that I want to get into the nuance of right here today with you guys on this live stream. He mentioned that if the Fed makes money, we all know that they pay that 6% dividend to their shareholders, which are the banksters, and anything above and beyond that, so they say, they pay back to the U.S. Treasury. They call this a remittance. But no one really questions, well, okay, that's if the Fed makes money. But what happens if the Fed loses money? Who bails out the Fed? And the answer is you do. Every single person on this live stream and every single person watching this video, if the Fed loses money, the banksters don't have to put up more equity or put up more capital to make sure that the Fed can continue to operate. Oh, no, no, no. That, that I mean, this is the ultimate privatizing the uh gains of the profits and socializing the losses uh, when you consider that 6% dividend where the banks are gain and the fact that they have absolutely no downside, zero risk. And by the way, wouldn't that incentivize the people who own the Fed to do more quantitative easing? And isn't that a perverse incentive structure? When the more quantitative easing they do, the bigger the balance sheet, therefore the more profit they make. And again, you say, well, Georgia's just getting 6%. Oh, no, no, no. Not that simple when you get into the gray area. And I've actually done whiteboard videos on this. And the Fed has, we'll call them secret accounts. We don't know how much goes into those accounts, but they do not give every single, they don't give 100% of the profits back to the treasury after they pay that 6% dividend yield. That I can assure you. But I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far. Let's get into this. Uh, let's get into the Fed's, website to understand how you guys will bail out the Fed and if their accounting shenanigans, let's say, create an environment that could lead to an economic collapse. Definitely a black swan event. Let's dive in. And it's going to get rather esoteric here, but I'm going to I'm going to walk you guys through this and explain to you what's going on. So this is from the Fed's website, federalreserve.org, SOMAs, which is their portfolio. So the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet, they just call it their SOMA portfolio. Unrealized loss. What does it mean? Well, and this is 2018, by the way, we really don't care about the unrealized loss. The Fed can manipulate the numbers and the accounting all they want, which they do. Uh, they say right here that they don't use gap accounting like a real company would have to. Uh, they use something, let's see, differences. Oh, they use something called Federal Reserve Accounting Principles. Oh, <laughs> oh man, that. Surprise, surprise, surprise. All right, so I don't want to go, that's a whiteboard video in and of itself, but I don't want to get into the Federal Reserve Accounting Principles and how that differs from GAAP. But uh, let's get into this section, which is interest rates and unrealized gains and losses. Because again, we're trying to figure out, okay, they're, they're not really being forthright about the realized gains and losses. You kind of have to sift through the fine print to see what happens there. But let's dive in here. Because market prices of treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities move inversely with respect to interest rates, when interest rates rise, all else equal, the value of the SOMA security holdings decrease. So they're admitting that if they've got a bunch of bonds on the asset side of their balance sheet, if interest rates go up, then the value of the asset side of their balance sheet goes down. And let's remember, what is the Fed talking about doing right now? Raising interest rates. So here they show this inverse relationship. So this dark, this black solid line, unrealized gains losses, and then you've got the interest rate on the 10-year treasury. And as expected, when the interest rate goes up, prices go down. Therefore, the value of their sort of their SOMA portfolio 
plummets. In recent years, the only Soma security sales conducted by the desk were, and by the way, you guys, Joseph Wang, he was the guy that was on the desk. So I don't know during 2018, I know during 2019, I believe. Yeah, actually 2018, he was there because he was doing quantitative tightening. So whenever we have my good friend, Joseph Wang on the channel, just keep in mind, he was the guy that was actually executing what they're referring to on their website. So in recent years, the only Soma security sales conducted by the desk were the small value testing purposes for any gains, losses that were realized did not have meaningful impact on net incomes. So they just kind of sent out trial balloons to see how this would operate in the real world. But uh, the, the, the size of the transactions were so small that it didn't really impact the overall net income. There are cases, however, in which a significant number of Soma securities were sold before maturity and the sales effect of the Federal Reserve's net income remittances on one such circumstance. And notice the circumstance they give you. And th this is important, guys, and, and you'll see this throughout the rest of this blog post where they say th they're giving this example of this MEP, which is Maturity Extension Program, under which the Federal Reserve sold or redeemed nearly $700 billion in short-term Treasury securities between the end of September 11th and end of September 12th, or September, excuse me, uh, September 2011 and the end of 2012. As interest rates at the time were lower than when the securities were originally purchased, the Federal Reserve, as a result of the program, recorded a net gain. And you'll notice whenever they're talking about the losses and the gains, they always focus on the gains. And whenever they bring up the losses, they kind of try to sweep it under the rug. Like, uh, yeah, we could have losses, but uh, yeah, don't worry about that because that's never going to happen. Oh, let's go back to when we had all these gains and we gave all this money to the treasury. They, they, they do this over and over and over again throughout the entire article if you read the whole thing, which I would suggest doing. This strategy therefore implies that Federal Reserve's treasury securities will be held until maturity, at which point the Federal Reserve will receive a par value. So now they're saying, well, for the majority of the portfolio, they're just going to hold it to maturity. Uh, really? Uh, Josh, what are they doing right now? Just remind me. A quantitative tightening? Oh, yeah, that's right. So are they holding that to maturity? Maybe. Uh, they could just let those T-bills roll off their balance sheet. But let's remember that the majority of the treasuries they have on their balance sheet are not T-bills. And if my memory serves me right, it's $325 billion in T-bills. And keep in mind, their balance sheet is $9 trillion. So a lot of this, although uh, Joseph Wang was telling me that when he did quantitative tightening, he would try to allow things to mature and just roll off the balance sheet instead of actually having to sell those assets into the market. But if they are serious about doing quantitative tightening this time around with a $9 trillion balance sheet and only 326, let's call it, billion in T-bills, they're going to have to sell a lot of assets before they mature. Moving on, in a declining interest rate environment, principal payments or prepayments are likely to increase, but it would be highly unlikely that realized losses stemming from prepayments could significantly affect the overall net income result for the Federal Reserve. See, they keep saying this, that yeah, there, there is that downside, but it's highly unlikely. It's highly unlikely. And you keep kind of reading the blog post, say, okay, well, I, I get it's highly unlikely, but what if it happens? Let's tell me that, Fed. What if it happens? And they just keep kind of kicking the can down the road by by these, oh, by by kind of just using this spin tactic or this again, it's kind of like a diversionary tactic where they're saying, yes, it could happen, but uh, oh, look, there's a squirrel, something like that. And they, they keep doing this throughout the blog post. In an increasing interest rate environment, prepayments would be depressed, leading to muted realized losses on mortgage-backed securities, even as the fair mortgage-backed securities decline. Okay, well, now we're getting somewhere. However, these principal and plans, principles and plans also note that for agency mortgage-backed securities, limited sales might be warranted in the longer run to reduce or eliminate residual holdings. If sales were to occur in this situation, then associated realized gains or losses with any sales would affect net income. So now they're saying, okay, well, we might kind of try to 
limit the amount or we would try to ration maybe the amount of sales to make sure that we weren't affecting net income to a significant degree, although it, it may be possible. But see, again, in the environment which we're in today, where the Fed is saying, and who knows if they do, but they're saying they're trying to really reduce the size of their balance sheet and quote unquote normalize, all of this goes completely out the window. Even under the very unlikely hypothetical scenario, <laughs> so it's not just, it's not unlikely, it's, it's very unlikely, and it's hypothetical. <laughs> See, we're still trying to get to, okay, what if you actually have significant realized losses? Who's holding the bag, Fed? Who's holding the bag? You see, they keep doing this. And you, you would think that they've gone over all of the great things about the Fed making all this money and doing the remittances back to the Treasury. But they just won't admit to what happens if uh, basically they try to pad and then sugarcoat everything before they give you actually what you're looking for. It's like they're trying to ease the blow of reality some way. It just, it, whenever, I don't see how people can trust the Fed. You know, it just goes back to what we're dealing with right now with the politicians and the central planners around the surveys of sickness. Like when you actually get into the nitty gritty of what these people in charge of institutions have said in the past and, and how they respond to just direct questions, it's, it's like the same standard operating procedure for all of these central planners, whether it's Walensky, whether it's Voldemort, or whether it's the Fed. It's like you have to go some, through some sort of training course on how to interact with the public. Yet you can give them the bad news, but what you do is you have like a 3,000 word blog post and you tell them all the good stuff and make up good stuff that really doesn't exist and tell them. And then once you get to the bottom, just go ahead and say that, yeah, maybe something bad could happen, but it's very, very unlikely. And well, just in case we got this hypothetical crazy scenario that only con the conspiracy theorists think of, well, then we might do something, but there again, that's never going to happen. But make sure that's at the, the bottom of the article. Yeah, it, it's, ah, it drives me crazy, but let's keep going. So going back to uh, the Fed sold, so even under the very unlikely hypothetical scenario in which the Fed sold a large amount of securities prior to maturity and incurred a sizable realized loss as a result. Okay, finally, now we're getting somewhere the Federal Reserve would still be able to meet its responsibilities and financial obligations. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're leaving me hanging there. How? How do, how, do you, how do you propose this? In particular, from a monetary policy standpoint, the losses alone would not affect the amount of depository institutions held with the Federal Reserve banks and would have no effect on them conducting monetary policy. Like, are you kidding me? It's just they're saying the same thing over and over and over again, hoping that you forget what your original question was. <laughs> okay, we get it. Let's get to the realized losses. Moreover, an unlikely scenario <laughs> in which realized losses were sufficiently large enough to result in an overall net income loss for the reserve banks, the Federal Reserve still or would still meet its finan financial obligations to cover operating expenses. Are, are you guys seeing the absurdity here? I mean, every single time you think they're going to answer the question, they have another sentence that just reiterates exactly what they said before. Oh, nothing to see here. Nothing to see here that the Fed can cover their operating expenses. Okay, we get it. How are you going to cover your operating expenses? And doesn't this make it so obvious that they're trying to hide something. In that case, remittances to the treasury would be suspended. Finally, we're getting somewhere. And a deferred asset would be recorded on the Fed's balance sheet. This goes back to the, yeah, that gap stuff, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, yeah, I mean, we require that for the bank. We require that for corporations and businesses. But uh, yeah, we don't really have to do that. The rules are for thee, not for me. 
That's the Fed's position here. So what they're saying is the remittances, let's say it would be uh, $100 billion going back to the Treasury from profits. If they took a loss on uh, you know some assets they sold, then that would reduce the amount of remittances. So that means what for the taxpayer? that their tax burden would increase in the future. Whether it's your tax burden through taxes directly or indirectly through inflation or the tax burden that's going to be on the shoulders of your kids, your grandkids, future generations. You see, because if the treasury is getting more from the Fed, then they're reducing the overall uh, debt burden for the taxpayer. So the less they get from the Fed, the more the tax burden for the taxpayer themselves. Given that large portion of the Federal Reserve's liabilities are comprised of Federal Reserve notes, and here's where you start really calling their BS. And I'm not talking about balance sheet. Given that a large portion of Federal Reserve liabilities are comprised of Federal Reserve notes, that means cash which have no interest expense and mostly collateralized by interest earning treasury mortgage-backed securities is unlikely, we have to say this one more time, that the Federal Reserve banks would be overall net loss position for very long. So if you guys have ever studied like kind of psychology with news writing and reporting, you, but I do, you have to realize people usually remember what's at the beginning and what's at the end. That's kind of how a speech works or news writing reporting. So you'll notice this is exactly what they're doing. And I guarantee you this is intentional. What we really want to know, they're trying to bury in just one sentence. But they want to start by giving this rosy picture, to say the least. And they want to end by saying, oh, don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. And I think this is definitely uh, intentional for sure. Oh, yes, I missed that point. So they're saying that, oh, well, you know, another thing that you need to consider and why you shouldn't be concerned at all, because not only is this very unlikely, but it's also hypothetical. Uh, but even if you still want to have any concern, you shouldn't, because a lot of our liabilities hold no interest. Therefore, we don't have to really have any money. Because liabilities don't cost us anything. Okay, out of the $9 trillion uh, liabilities of the Fed, what percentage of that is green pieces of paper. I mean, come on, give me a break. Uh, th the answer is a very, very minuscule percentage. And the fact that they would even bring that up shows you that they're being completely disingenuous. Importantly, we conclude by stressing, there is no reason to believe that policy actions would be affected by the impact or by their impact on the Federal Reserve's net income. How many times do they have to say this? Oh, geez. Just, if you ever trusted the central planners of the Fed, just read this. Use some intuition and some common sense, for heaven's sakes. In fact, their fair value of the Federal Reserve portfolio, as well as its earning gains or losses, do not affect the ability to carry out its responsibilities to the nation's central bank for the ninth time which is to conduct mon monetary policy to achieve statutory goals of maximum employment and stable prices. Oh, they forgot about propping up the stock market and doing the bidding of the Biden administration <laughs> or any of the administrations. I don't want to uh, you know, seem as though that I'm throwing the Biden administration under the bus. I'm glad, I'm happy to throw all the administrations under the bus, Democrat or Republican. I dislike them both equally. So then we get into what, what's really interesting for, uh, well, I guess everyone's going to say the macro geeks watching right now. But I, I think even if you're just the average Joe and Jane, understanding how much power, psychological power the Fed has, uh, this next part is still extremely important. We talked about uh, gap accounting. And then, uh, let's see, gap accounting principles are established by accounting standards setting box as the financial accounting standards board. However, Accounting principles for entities with the unique powers and responsibility of the nation's central bank have not been formulated by these bodies. Wow, that's convenient, isn't it? 
you know, the more I read the Fed's website, the more little Easter eggs I find. <laughs> oh, so going over to that, let's say, unique accounting of the Federal Reserve, which if any other company did it, they would be considered Enron. Hmm, imagine that. But they have something called a deferred asset. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So what a deferred asset is, is if you are losing money hand over fist, you don't have to have negative equity. Oh, no, 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 not anymore. Not by Federal Reserve accounting principles <laughs> that were set up by none other than the Federal Reserve themselves. What you can do is you can just set up a deferred asset. This is really, really cool. And again, if a corporation did this, the person that did it would go straight to prison. <laughs> One aspect of the Federal Reserve's banking accounting that will be important in some scenarios is the deferred asset. When Reserve Bank, and uh, just uh, FYI, this is on the Federal Reserve's website, but this is a PDF paper, about a 30-page paper. You have to get into page 15. So probably no one other than myself, maybe Lynn Alden or Jeff Snyder, would ever be this nerdy <laughs> to actually get to page 15. But uh, that's why you guys watch this channel. That's the value I can deliver. So when Federal Reserve Bank income not sufficient to cover interest expenses, here we go. This is the scenario that the previous blog post told us was very unlikely and completely hypothetical. So when the Reserve Bank doesn't have the income not sufficient to cover interest expenses, realize losses, operating and other expenses, a deferred asset is created. And so the deferred asset basically reflects future earnings. So basically what happens is, let's say they have negative equity, they can just fill that gap with a deferred asset saying that, well, uh, yeah, we don't have the money now, but uh, we'll get it in the future. So therefore we'll just book the asset as if we have it today. There you go. That's how the Fed operates. So if you were ever wondering if the monetary system i.e. the central bank especially, uh, is just a complete shell game of confidence, there you have it. What they'll do is it's just accounting shenanigans, and they will change the accounting to do pretty much anything they want to do. If you ever uh, wanted, or if you ever needed rationale for having a base money system that cannot be created by the central banks themselves. I don't care whether it's gold, Bitcoin, uh, this should be your, your proof positive right here. I mean, if I was doing, if I was the lawyer trying to prove a case to some uh, impartial jury as to why we need base money that was, uh, that the Fed could not print, this is one of the first things that I would give them right here. Uh, they just basically can do whatever they want willy-nilly, and they'll just uh, create an accounting exception or their own accounting rules just to do whatever it is that's going to benefit them. And who is them? That's the banksters that own the reserve in the first place. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Always stand up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. And remember, if the Fed loses money, you are on the hook. We'll see you in the next video.